Welcome to ESGX Live, the community for education and information that we hope inspires collaboration and action. We have a fantastic show today with guests joining us from around the world, some very early in the morning for which we're very grateful. Just to kick things off, I thought I would share a few snippets that I have learned myself from the, the, prepar the preparatory discussions we've had over the last few days. Firstly, we all know that 70% or thereabouts of the land, or of the surface of the earth is, la is the ocean and only 30% is the land. When it comes to habitat though, much, much more lies in the oceans because of course in the oceans, creatures live in three dimensions, not on two as most of us do on land. Secondly, who actually is responsible for that ocean? About 40% of the oceans lie in special economic zones controlled by individual countries. And about 20 of those countries can uh, control a significant proportion of that. What's interesting as you can see here is that whilst there are some countries you might expect at the top of this list, like the United States, France and Australia are right up there too. And there are also a host of much smaller countries, the green and orange bars or the green and orange dots on this chart, which show you the populations too, that are enormously smaller and still are responsible for nearly a quarter of the area accounted for by those top 25, those top 20 uh, countries. The last thing I wanted to share before handing over to my special co-host for today, Doug Heskey, is that the oceans reached their productive capacity back in the 1990s, at least measured by the amount of food that we could take out of the oceans to feed the people that live on the land. And all the additional seafood we've consumed has been produced by man rather than harvested from the open ocean. So with that, by way of introduction, I will hand over to Doug to introduce the day. Nigel, thank you very much and welcome everybody on the line and of course our guest speakers today. I'd like to start by saying that today's discussion is very near and dear to my heart. I've been an advocate for ocean health my entire life and have had remarkable experiences diving around the world. I've been fortunate to have had the experience of diving in protected marine habitats like Palau and places in the Philippines when family members were based in those locations. I've also witnessed over several decades the destruction of coral reefs due to global warming and tourism. These experiences are part of what drove us to become an important impact platform for ocean health and to create the New Day Ocean Health Portfolio, which can be found at newdayimpact.com. So before we turn this important discussion on oceans, I'd like to share that it would be inappropriate to start today's session without recognizing the fact that we are in the midst of an incredibly challenging time in our nation's history. Our hearts go out to the black community and every community of peoples around the world that have suffered from oppression and discrimination. The core of our work at New Day Impact, HIP Investor, Pottinger and at ESGX is focused on transformational change that improves our world, whether it be on social equity issues or environmental issues like ocean health. We recognize that there are issues that need to be solved for today, not tomorrow, and that finding solutions for these important global problems requires a collaborative effort between NGOs, corporates, governments, academic institutions, citizens like you and many others. While today we'll be focusing on solutions for ocean health, we're also mindful and sensitive to the social upheaval that's occurring right here in our backyard. And as such, we will be focusing our next two ESGX events on solutions, solutions for equality next week and a special ESGX event on June 16th entitled Roads to Refuge. Degradation of our planet's ecosystems like ocean health disproportionately affects people of color, people with less financial means, and people across the global south. And we can, as we consider global warming, rising sea levels, and mass migration due to climate change, these segments of our world population will feel the direct and the direct impacts more than any others. So with that, let's turn to oceans. A critical part of our work is educating our community on a broad swath of impact and sustainability issues. 
and most of them align with the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Among the 17 goals, SDG 14, Life Underwater, focuses on conserving and sustainably using the oceans and marine resources for sustainable development, including reducing marine pollution, protecting coastal ecosystems, ending illegal fishing, and addressing the impact of climate change. When we discuss environmentalism and sustainability, there's very little that's not touched by ocean and water habitats as our world depends on the ocean's role in supporting our planet by regulating the Earth's temperature and serving as a ventilator for our planet. The financial shortfall to address these solutions for these problems is significant and is estimated that it will cost $175 billion a year to meet the United Nations goal by 2030. That currently represents a funding gap of approximately $150 billion a year, given what's currently been pledged. Understandably, this is a complex issue and we'll be highlighting three important subject matters as Nigel had addressed to address solutions during today's e-conference. Before introducing today's moderators, I'd like to express a very special thanks to several people who have been instrumental in supporting today's event. Scotty Schmidt, co-founder and CEO of Primary Ocean Producers, a world premier seaweed cultivation and products company, and Chris Breen, head of partnerships at Public Goods, Public Goods, a sustainable consumer products company, and of course, our two partners and moderators. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you first, Dirk Rosen. Dirk is Executive Director of Marine Applied Research Exploration, an environmental organization based in Richmond, California, which is exploring and documenting deep water ecosystems in support of their conservation and management. And my friend Christopher Oakes, Vice President of Product and Marketing Development for Nova Nutrients, a synthetic biology company based in Sunnyvale, California, transforming industrial waste CO2 into feed through industrial biotech, initially for the fast growing aquaculture sector. So without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to Dirk. Thank you, Doug. And thank you for your opening remarks. So uh, I wanna start by uh, introducing my co-table setters here, uh, Dr. Lita Taneva with the California Ocean Science Trust and Michael Sutton with the Goldman Environmental Prize. Together, uh, we're going to talk about kind of some high level ocean threats, opportunities and solutions that have already happened as, as waves of example moving forward. And uh, I wanna start with a more than a 30,000 foot view, uh, something much, much greater. And that is uh, from outer space. So, um, but if, if you can see this picture and I would love to get a chat letting me know that you can see the uh, PowerPoint slide because my screen appears to be frozen. Uh, but my former boss, Mike Gernhardt was an astronaut and when we worked on space station together. And I spent five years there and a lot of the work that we did was creating what I call the hotel functions uh, of, of the International Space Station. In other words, for man to live there, we needed to have uh, oxygen bled in, we needed to scrub out the CO2, and we needed habitable living quarters that fell within the temperature range of the people living there. Much the same as with submarines. So with my mentor, Graham Hawks, we built six different submarines to take people as deep as the Marianas Trench. Same sorts of issues there. You have to bleed in oxygen and get rid of that CO2, and you have to keep the pilots comfortable for as long as they're there. And yet, the, our oceans provide this for free on our blue planet. It's, uh, it's just natural, and that's how we evolved as, as human species. And so we're set up uh, to live here without doing anything, without having to design it, build it, test it, and maintain it. So that uh, the oceans provide 50% of our oxygen, half, every other breath you take. They scrub out 30% of the carbon dioxide that comes from the burning of fossil fuels, and they absorb 90% of the heat that's also generated 
from the burning of carbon fuels. And there's some other benefits too. And that is the oceans provide 90% of the habitable space as Nigel alluded to earlier, and they feed 2 billion people. In other words, of the 7 billion people on the planet right now, 2 billion derive their primary source of protein from the ocean. So what are the differences uh, between the land and ocean? And I was encouraged to, to talk about this just to set the table for our next two speakers who have a lot to talk about. First of all, uh, our land is not that tall, 800 meters, 2,600 feet tall on average, whereas the ocean is 3,700 feet. This is deeper than two miles deep on average. So no wonder we haven't seen much of it. And it's also opaque. We can't look that far into the oceans with our naked eye. Also light doesn't penetrate that far. As far as land goes, it's mostly been surveyed visually with cameras uh, and now by satellite, whereas the ocean remains a frontier. Less than 5% has been explored below scuba depth. Back to land, we've learned to take care of our wildlife and our plants. And so we've set aside worldwide, terrestrially, 16% of our area to parks and reserves. Whereas in the ocean, it's the opposite. Less than 5% is set aside as a reserve or park and the rest is open for fishing or some form of exploitation. There's no sanctuary to speak of. Finally, we've had the concept of land ownership and stewardship for a hundred years or more. Whereas the ocean remains a wild west and, and a, a really a race to extract those resources. So those are my remarks and I can't wait to introduce you to Dr. Lita Teneva who's gonna now talk about a number of things I'm sure you'll find fascinating. So thank you, Lita. Thank you, Dirk. It's an honor to be part of this event. And I also would like to thank Doug for acknowledging the <clears throat> extraordinary and tough times we find ourselves in. Environmental justice is very often um, aligned with social justice. So working in the ocean space is an important part of global progress, I think. So I'll briefly go over the benefits we get from the ocean, the threats we pose to ocean health and the innovations that give me hope for the future. Really, the ocean gives us life. Uh, we know that the ocean is what keeps this planet habitable. And so in many, many ways, therefore, ocean health is human health. And making, in some ways, some would say ocean conservation may be also a humanitarian effort. Um, as everyone uh, already heard, the oceans represent 70% of the space of the planet, of the surface. What we have here in this image is the Pacific Ocean, which can actually fit the entire landmass in it. So we have a lot of um, ocean space. And some have estimated that if the ocean were a country, it would be the seventh biggest economy um, worth about $2.5 tr trillion, dollars, excuse me. We know that just in the US, the blue economy, and this is everything dependent on ocean resources, um, is about $370 billion per year. In California alone, that's $45 billion, so very essential. What does the ocean give us? We heard it gives us oxygen through the activity of plants in the ocean. The ocean traps heat and traps um, carbon, which um, and regulating the climate in that way. The ocean gives jobs and income, food, energy, biodiversity, clean water, many other benefits, including coastal protection, cultural identity, a sense of belonging for many cultures. The abundance of life in the ocean that has adapted to various living conditions um, also can allow us to find new medicines. And this is an ongoing um, uh, area of research. In the deep ocean, we are already seeing promise for breakthroughs in antibiotics, antidepressants, helpful compounds in the battle to eradicate Alzheimer's disease even. Why is this biodiversity so important? 
It's estimated that as many as 2 million species may be living in the ocean. And remember, the ocean is 95% of the living space on this planet. But science has actually only described about 10% of that. So there's yet much to be discovered and explored. And that richness of life, that biodiversity, ensures that ecosystems everywhere from which people benefit can stay functioning and productive. Biodiversity is like insurance, really. Um, or you can think of it as bank savings. Uh, you want to live off the and not the capital. Now, we're also on the brink of exploiting and mining in the deep sea for various compounds that, um, that we need for our phones and uh, other electronics and in the renewable energy industry. And this map here shows you where some of those areas of interest are. And that is very contentious. You'll hear more about this later today. Sometimes we also use the ocean just as a space to move things across. So interestingly, uh, most of our internet is actually not in the cloud, it is in the ocean. There are about 750,000 miles of fiber optic cable in the ocean that satisfies the entertainment and communication needs of the world. And that's three times the distance between the earth and the moon. So that's on the bottom. On the surface of the ocean, we happen to move 95% of global trade because, that's, because shipping is the cheapest, most efficient way to move things. Now imagine the innovation, or what innovation could help um, if we develop clean fuels or better fuel efficiency for those ships that control 95% of trade. And the difference something like that could make for reducing carbon emissions and serving as a climate change solution. Now we do um, some other things on the surface, uh, such as renewable offshore wind energy. Now we're all familiar with renewable wind energy. Um, it's not common very, uh, very much yet in the ocean. Uh, however, we know that we can meet the world's entire annual energy demand from offshore wind in, a, in an area that is roughly the size of Texas in the ocean. And that's just staggering. So, so that's a very exciting um, thing on the horizon here. We also know that the price of electricity is actually dropping. So offshore wind uh, initial projects are showing that the megawatt prices are actually dropping to, to levels that are competitive in the Northeastern US markets. Okay, so that, but what have we actually done to the ocean so far? Well, if you look at this, this graphic, you know, we've been basically putting too much in, too much plastic pollution, carbon pollution, oil, et cetera. We're taking too much out, various kinds of extractive industries, and we're messing up the edges with unchecked coastal development. And if you look at this map, this is an index of cumulative impacts, and red is bad. And you can see almost no area of the ocean has remained untouched from negative impact. Now that may seem grim, but remember, I'm trying to balance uh, the, the good and the bad here. And I wanna leave you with a hopeful, hopeful message because I'm very optimistic. Now the three-legged stool of ocean and climate solutions consists of science, business, and policy in my mind. And all of those working in concert to secure a better future for nature and people with respect to the oceans. Crises also are often opportunities for innovation. Now more than ever, we're seeing an uptick in innovation in the ocean space with various startups and incubators and so forth. And there are many examples in sustainable seafood, surveillance technology, energy sources, um, all kinds of things. And more, uh, you'll hear more about some of those later today. Now, in terms of science, scientists have many eyes on the ocean many sensors on the surface, many sensors in the deep. And we need to see better just because like Dirk said, um, the ocean is not very visible inside and we need to know what's happening to it. We need to know uh, all the, the critters that are living there in order to know how to best protect it and how to create sustainable uses that are not using up what we have and are not messing it up beyond repair. And human exploration in the ocean also is very important. We need to keep send, sending people uh, into the ocean to remind humanity uh, that uh, 
this is our most critical system. We need discoveries, exploration, and monitoring in order to inform what we're all talking about here today, intelligent ocean management. And this is what organizations like my organization and that of Dirk do, MARE and California Ocean Science Trust, work with governments to deliver the best available science to help policymakers make sound decisions for good ocean governance that works well for nature and people. That communication is really critical. Now, both of our organizations primarily work in California, and you may hear later today about how uh, difficult but very important this process is in, in science policy, translating science into making change on the water. And you may hear about case study with marine parks here, protected areas, the Yosemites and the Yellowstones that are just off our coast here in California. But let's briefly go global again. What does uh, global ocean policy uh, look like? The United Nations Con uh, Convention of the Law of the Sea was formally adopted in 1982. It has 182 signatories. It's a framework that governs ocean and maritime activities in designated national and international waters. National waters are also called the exclusive economic zone. And you'll see that's the lighter blue in that image there. That extends 200 miles from a uh, nation's coast. The world nations putting it all together comprise about 40% of the entire ocean. And the rest around 60% is international waters or what's also called the high seas. Now there are many rules governing behavior in national and international waters, resource use, resource extraction, et cetera. However, more is needed in the international space. So currently at the United Nations, negotiations are ongoing for a high seas treaty. Now, we really hope that a high seas treaty would uh, result in better practices and resource extraction, hopefully would reduce crime at sea because um, illegal activity in the ocean often involves not only damage to nature, but also egregious human rights abuses that we rarely hear about, but they are rampant. And before I hand it off over to Mike, uh, I just wanna very briefly say a few things about uh, seafood, because in my view, the most exciting future opportunities for um, ocean stewardship that involve science, business, innovation, and good policy are in energy and food production. The world's insatiable appetite for fish is understandable from a business perspective because the seafood and fisheries industry annually tops 40, uh, uh, excuse me, a hundred billion dollars. Plus, seafood is tasty. Seafood is the animal protein with the lowest carbon footprint. And as we said, a key source of protein for many millions of people in developing nations. Now, at the same time, uh, climate change is going to affect lots of fish populations in the equatorial and tropical regions, further um, threatening food security in those particular places. So if we're trying to feed the world and also use the oceans towards climate solutions, Creating sustainable seafood uh, that, that feeds more people, uh, that also contributes to, to reducing global carbon emissions in total. Now, in, in the US, we love our seafood. Uh, we consume more every year than can actually be produced. And that's primarily tuna, salmon, and shrimp. And when told that 90% of seafood consumed in the US comes from abroad, a New York fisherman asked, Who's the broad? <laughs> well, in fact, the source is mostly imported, farmed seafood. And there are many challenges with sustainable aquaculture, including pollution, habitat destruction, um, forms of feed, especially for carnivorous fish. However, undoubtedly, as I think we'll all agree today, farming fish is part of our collective future if we're to find a balance between protecting wild populations protecting ocean health um, and providing nutrition for a growing human population. I will end with two very quick highlights on a really interesting aspect of, of ocean farming, which is seaweed, which is very, um, uh, very much in its infancy. So farming seaweed together with shellfish can actually locally decrease 
the uh, ocean acidification in a certain area. And as you all probably know, that's um, essentially the osteoporosis of the ocean or global warming's evil twin. Now farming seaweed can also be used for agriculture on land as a fertilizer and can be used as feed for cattle, which interestingly, again, links to climate solutions because that would um, reduce carbon emissions for agriculture. So in short, many challenges, but many opportunities for solutions too, if science, business, and policy work together. Now I'd like to hand it over to Mike Sutton from whom I've learned an incredible amount about effective and strategic ocean conservation. Thank you. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, everybody. As uh, most of you know, you know, the vast majority of people around the world are not surfers. They're not marine biologists like uh, Dr. Deneva. They're, they're not scuba divers or submariners like Dirk. Uh, for most of us, our most intimate knowledge of the oceans comes in the form of seafood. Uh, as Lita pointed out, uh, the ocean is not just the lungs of the planet. For many of us, it's also the dinner table. Uh, indeed, an estimated two to three billion people around the world derive their main source of protein from seafood. So this is an important source of food, not just for the ecosystem, but for people who live and work on the ocean as well. Now, um, commercial fishing <clears throat> is a form of market hunting. <clears throat> defined as the industrial killing of wild animals for food. We used to do that on land. <clears throat> we hunted species like the buffalo to near extinction for the market. In fact, so many species declined on land that we outlawed the commercial hunting of wildlife uh, on land at the, around the turn of the last century. We quickly moved from hunting to farming on land. Uh, we call that the green revolution. <clears throat> but we still hunt wildlife in our oceans for food on a commercial scale, and we call it commercial fishing. Uh, many of our favorite seafood species are carnivores, um, like tuna, swordfish, sharks, salmon, and so forth. These are the ocean's top predators. It's as if we were hunting lions, tigers, and grizzly bears on land and feeding them to people on an industrial scale. And just like on land, many commercial fisheries over the years have proven unsustainable. In fact, commercial fish landings leveled off in the 1980s and 1990s and haven't grown since. The only reason our seafood supply has continued to grow is because of aquaculture or fish farming. You're gonna hear later from people like Neil Sims that have a lot of experience with aquaculture. Just like on land, fishing is giving way to farming. Today, more than half of our seafood comes from fish farms. The Green Revolution succeeded on land, succeeded in feeding millions and billions of people. But the environmental cost of modern ag agriculture was staggering. Our challenge in the ocean is to make sure the Blue Revolution, shifting from fishing to fish farming, doesn't have the same negative impact on the planet as the Green Revolution on land. So how do we make fisheries and aquaculture more sustainable? That is the challenge. It's been the challenge for a while, it continues to be the challenge today. But the good news is today we have more tools than ever uh, and more opportunities than ever to help fisheries and aquaculture become more sustainable. The first tool, of course, is government action, strengthening laws, treaties, and regulation. And that's over the years, that's only partially been successful. I was part of the effort to strengthen the United States' main fisheries law, federal fisheries law back in the, in the 1990s. Uh, but many fisheries have declined under sophisticated management around the world. Government action by itself is not enough. So <clears throat> eventually we got tired of lobbying the government to improve its management. So we created a worldwide movement to build market incentives for sustainable fisheries. We called it the sustainable seafood movement. In our oceans, the, the arm of the law may be relatively short, but the market reaches everywhere. So market-based approaches to conservation can have a truly global reach. One great example that I know many of you will be familiar with is the Seafood Watch Program in the United States. It's founded at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, uh, started with uh, pocket guides to sustainable seafood. Inevitably, we developed an app. Uh, so now um, you too can be a really boring dinner companion and tell all your friends what not to order. Uh, and they'll tell you to shut up. But 
um, the point is here, what began as a consumer awareness tool soon grew to help big seafood buyers like supermarket chains and contract food service companies make better choices. Um, in addition to Seafood Watch, as the movement grow, uh, grew, we developed the Marine Stewardship Council. It was founded in Europe about 20 years ago and created the first global eco-label for seafood. And today, about 20 per, about 15 percent of world fisheries are eligible to display the blue and white eco label of the MSC. Winning certification. Oh, by the way, here's here's what it looks like in your local Whole Foods if you shop at Whole Foods in the U.S. On the uh, on the left, uh, farmed Atlantic salmon, a relatively poor choice. It's on the red list. On the right, uh, the rich red color of sockeye, wild sockeye salmon from Alaska, bearing the MSC eco label. So the consumer has a stark choice, right, right, products right next to one another in the marketplace. Um, winning certification as a sustainable fishery serves as an aspirational goal with fishery improvement projects around the world, many funded by industry, helping fisheries qualify. But I should say the most exciting development today in my mind is the growing number of opportunities to invest in sustainable fisheries and aquaculture, to deploy private capital uh, in pursuit of sustainability. Many startup companies today are working to improve the performance of fisheries and seafood production. You're gonna hear about some of them today. Even going beyond aquaculture to grow seafood in the lab, the sort of the impossible burger of seafood. I'm excited about the opportunities today for investors of all sizes to promote more sustainable fisheries and aquaculture by supporting these startups and other companies in this field. So I'll turn it back to Dirk uh, to carry on with the next panel. Hi, I'm back. Um, we are going to move into the resurgence fisheries panel. And thank you, Mike, for uh, setting the table so well for our panelists. Uh, I think we're just gonna kick it off right away with Sam. Uh, and then I'm going to go forth as your token ocean engineer, but we're going to talk about uh, the e economics of fisheries. We're going to talk about some of the threats and opportunities once again. I think you really enjoy Sam. And Sam, where are you reaching us from right now? I'm calling in from Freeport, Grand Bahama. Uh, so as was mentioned, I, uh, I'm Sam Teicher. I'm the co-founder and chief reef officer of Coral Vita, which is a company that's working to scale reef restoration around the world to protect these critically important ecosystems. Uh, next slide, please. So many of us think about coral reefs as one of the most magical and inspiring ecosystems on the earth. And, and for me, they are. I've been a diver since I was 13. But if you put aside their ecological wonder, they're also one of the most critically important ecosystems on the planet. So conservatively, they generate about $30 billion a year through tourism and fisheries and coastal protection. They sustain a quarter of all marine life, even though they take up less than 1% of the seafloor and sustain the livelihoods of up to 1 billion people in over 100 nations. And in particular, uh, they benefit communities of color uh, and in the global south who rely on these ecosystems for their heritage and for protection from storms and for jobs and to put food on their families' plates. Unfortunately, coral reefs are dying. We've lost half the world's coral reefs in the past few decades and are on track to lose over 90% in just the next 30 years. So not that far away from almost all the world's coral reefs disappearing. And this is largely due to uh, factors like overfishing, and habitat destruction and pollution, but also climate change. There's a th uh, threshold for the acidity and temperatures that corals can withstand. And we're already seeing now corals dying in front of our eyes. Here in the Bahamas, 80% of the reefs are dead. Uh, we also have a disease outbreak as a result of uh, uh, an unknown factor, but it's burst out here in the Bahamas uh, after Hurricane Dorian last year, which we went through. And this is, this is not a problem for the future. This is happening right now. Fortunately, there is a solution. Now, the best thing to do by far is solve climate change, it's end habitat destruction. 
but recognizing that our leaders in politics and business and the media aren't doing what they should be doing most of that adaptation solutions now. And one of these is coral reef restoration. Now, over the past few decades, it's been shown, imagine like reforestation, corals can be grown and planted into reefs and, and they can come back to life. And this has been done all around the world at, at sort of small scale levels. But unfortunately, the current model for reef restoration has a number of significant limitations. They are largely based in these ocean underwater gardens like the ones you see here, which have to be set up and maintained near every reef that needs to be restored. Uh, there's a limitation in terms of the number of species that can be grown, how you can enhance the resiliency of these corals to threats like climate change. And as well, they're largely run by a, a host of really amazing NGOs and scientists, but they're largely uh, grant funded uh, or donation funded. And considering the scope of the problem, again, 90% of reefs dead in the next 30 years, uh, there isn't enough grant funding to, to take us to where we need to go. And that's why we started Coral Vita. Uh, it's a company that is integrating breakthrough methods uh, for reef restoration together with a commercial land-based farming model to scale restoration globally. So working with our advisors and developing science of our own, we are incorporating these techniques where we can grow corals up to 50 times faster. So that's months instead of decades. Some corals, like the branching corals, the ones that look like deer's antlers, they can go from the size of your thumb to your hand and wrist in six to nine months. But a lot of those bouldering species, brain corals and the like, could take 50 years to get the size of the dinner plate. And using natural healing processes from within the corals, we can now grow those in months instead of decades. The land-based system lets us also take advantage of what are known as assisted evolution techniques to strengthen the resilience of the corals to warming and acidifying oceans. And then we can also integrate sexual breeding techniques. Corals make babies. Again, it's kind of analogous to pollination. And we can induce the conditions to help breed corals that are genetically diverse and as well are resilient. Now, on top of that, at sound ecological practices, working with local communities uh, is a key part of our model uh, as we do this work, uh, as well as do this as a business. So again, thinking back to the value of reefs, how can we incentivize stakeholders who've normally ignored them to actually protect them? Uh, we sell reef restoration as a service to hotels, governments, cruise lines, uh, corporate sponsors, reinsurance industry, everyone that has a skin in the game on reefs can hire Coral Vita to restore the reefs they depend on. And we think this can galvanize an actual industry for, for protecting reefs and inject the capital needed to preserve them for the future. At the same time, our farms are on land. And so we do two things with them. One is we turn them into education centers for the local communities, people who depend on these reefs the most. Uh, fishermen, students, you name it, can come and get hands-on learning uh, at our farms. And then we also monetize our operations. And so we hope that you'll come down to Grand Bahama uh, and all of our future farms. And you can see for yourself how we grow corals and why they matter. And we can generate revenue through uh, site visits as well as uh, coral adoptions or, or planting corals. So just to sort of wrap up here at Coral Vita, we, we, we raised an investment round. It was the first ever for reef restoration. We launched our pilot farm in Grand Bahama. Things were going great. We then got hit in the face by Hurricane Dorian. That's a longer story I can tell you about if you'd like to hear it, but we are back on our feet uh, after doing humanitarian work in the, in the local island. Um, and not only have rebuilt the farm, but now are actually preparing to expand this into the largest coral farm in the world, capable of growing uh, 100,000 corals a year. We're, we're raising $2 million to do that. And then ultimately we wanna put farms like this in every country with reefs around the world, working with local communities, scientists, the private sector, governments, uh, everyone who depends on reefs, we're sort of all in this together, as we've heard about from all the other uh, speakers, and we will continue to hear this is a team effort to protect the ocean. And um, we are very much looking forward to, to here. And, and for anyone who's interested, I, I look forward to talking to you. And thanks for your time. Okay, Scott, are you ready to take over? And where are you calling from? Yeah, let me just start my video here. Uh, it says my the host has stopped the video. So here, we, here we go. Yeah, okay, hello. Um, I'm calling from uh, Northern Palawan in the Philippines on a little island called Dimipak. And uh, 
my uh, again, uh, I'm the executive director of the Coral Triangle Conservancy, and this is one of our marine monitoring stations. And uh, I want to thank Sam for that great lead in about the importance of coral reefs. Uh, we are, um, I've been actually quarantined here for the last four months, uh, living off grid with very little food and supplies, but obviously with a great internet connection. And the waters around this small island have experienced a sharp decline in fish and marine life over the past two decades due to a combination of uh, human activities. And so we're deploying a, a, a variety of technologies to help reduce illegal fishing within a network of locally managed marine areas controlled by the Tugbanwa indigenous people of Kalawi and monitoring an area of about 15,000 square kilometers to deter illegal fishing. So it's a great story because the indigenous people here were forced to leave this place and only several years ago were able to return and become stewards of the environment and now desire to create ecosystem sized marine protected areas and to reduce overfishing. So in the last nine years, our not for profit organization is focused on community engagement and technology enabled tools for conservation in coastal waters. So we're here to help the Tugbanwa with these technology tools and to better manage their 50,000 hectares of coral reefs, islands, and jungles. And, you know, they're a historically marginalized people. So I think about what's happening in the United States and the struggles of, of minorities in the U.S. And, and the Tugbanwa were literally one of the most looked down uh, groups of people here. And they, they fought hard and they managed to not only reclaim their ancestral home, but um, now will be the stewards of the environment here. So it's, it's a really great success story in their struggle. So I'll, I'll jump right into the biggest challenges facing fisheries management, uh, not only in the Philippines, but in developing countries in general. And I'll highlight some cost-effective solutions that we're deploying with hopes that others will copy or even improve upon to scale quickly to help our marine environments. So after living here for 20 years, there are so many warning signs that a collapse is imminent. Um, but little wonder when you understand that many factors impacting uh, this crucial resource. Part of the challenges though is uh, the problems are systemic, widespread and needing concerted actions in multiple directions. Firstly, uh, there are now large numbers of foreign vessels in the waters south and west of the Philippines. By far, the Chinese industrial fishing fleet is doing the most damage, uh, but here in Palawan, you are just as likely to run across pirate fishing vessels from Vietnam and Taiwan. Um, the Chinese have claimed ownership of islands inside the Philippines' exclusive economic zone, backfilled thousands of hectares of coral reef atolls, and turned biodiversity hotspots into military installations with forward bases to support further expansion for commercial fishing. Now, uh, they fish with impunity through large swaths of Filipino territory. The Chinese Coast Guard, well, it's actually their Navy, routinely ram and chase away local vessels while protecting Chinese vessels from local enforcement efforts. So the Philippine Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, and Maritime Police have largely abandoned the region due to this bullying by China as they strip mine the Philippines of marine life for commercial value. So however, our organization is focused on conservation efforts in the most productive fishing areas in depths of less than 200 meters on the continental shelves where most of the biodiversity is packed in. Uh, usually this is about 50 kilometers from shore uh, where 80% of the fishing activity is occurring and 90% of the small scale fishermen are operating. Uh, the demand for illegally caught fish and wildlife may still be coming from China, but it's Filipino owned and operated boats that we come across in our patrols near the coast. And what we've experienced is a combination of lax enforcement, political indirection, corrupt officials, uh, underfunded and understaffed that have seen the Philippines become ground zero for the many forms of destructive fishing. In my time here, I've, I've literally seen all of them and as well as the devastating destruction of shallow water habitats, including seagrass, mangroves, coral reefs that will make recovery increasingly difficult. Um, for this nearshore environment, which constitutes about 5% of the area of the planet, the challenges include persistent poverty and food security among rapidly growing populations of subsistence fishermen with increasingly destructive fishing methods and more access to low cost technology, which is making it easier for them to target the few remaining pockets of fish, eh, which is obviously a problem. Um, the illegal fishing methods that we're most focused on addressing uh, is fish bombing 
the use of chemical poisons to stun and make fish easier to catch, uh, hookah diving compressors using spear guns, and um, you know, all of these are, are practiced throughout the Philippines, despite claims that these practices have been reduced or eliminated. So our solutions to these challenges include uh, technology-enabled monitoring using the NOAA Beers satellite network for the visible light spectrum to detect super lights from large commercial fishing vessels operating within municipal waters, networks of underwater acoustic sensors to measure fish bombing activity as far as 25 kilometers from the sensors, um, software enhanced marine radar um, using AI and predictive analytics to tell us what the boats are doing and then send automated um, notifications to uh, rangers to uh, go ahead and investigate, find out what's, what that boat is doing. And long range drones with automated flight patterns that um, send first person video back that we can record and use as uh, evidence for um, prosecution. But with more than 7,100 islands spread over an area of three, three quarters the size of California, the Philippines struggles with fisheries enforcement. So many agencies are involved, but it allows them to sit back and expect the others to do the work. So there are at least six government agencies, each with overlapping responsibilities, and most are content to do not much. Um, local governments are also uh, forming yet more departments to address plummeting fish stocks, in part because in action of the proper enforcement bodies. So when I look at the gaps analysis of um, you know, master plans for these areas, over and over and over again, we see monitoring and enforcement, monitoring and enforcement. So again, a lot of our uh, programs and technologies are really um, trying to enhance using technology tools, internet of things, uh, satellites, networks of sensors to help us to, um, to do better monitoring that isn't subject to human error or corruption. So in parallel with this course, uh, lack of enforcement is the judiciary. The Philippines is trying to address corruption and but by far too often, few legal fishing cases brought before the courts have been throw out, thrown out under dubious circumstances. And this continues to happen and the fishery will be continued to be plundered. As a volunteer enforcement group, we have had a hard time even bringing cases to court and it's completely demoralizing to stay up for nights and nights on end to catch these illegal boats and catch the bad actors only to see our work negated with a single signature from a bribed judge. So those are the illegal methods, but then we have a variety of um, legal methods, including fine mesh gill nets, long lines, and various forms of fish traps that are cheap, widely available, and, um, and you can see them everywhere. You know, every, every kilometer of coastline, you may come across a dozen of these 300 meter long gill nets with, with mesh size, the size of your fingernail. And um, they get, they're, they're indiscriminate killers that, that kill everything from sharks, turtles, you know, dugong, everything. And it's, it's, a, it's kind of a lazy way or a third world country that doesn't have the resources to help feed the poor. They pretty much just let the poor uh, use these nets to feed themselves. And, um, and that's in absence of social programs and, and social welfare programs to help uh, provide food security. Um, so until these, these laws are changed, uh, like they are in most, most countries, most first world countries have outlawed a lot of these fishing tactics. Um, we encourage 30% uh, of their uh, coastal areas to be set aside in no-take marine sanctuaries, specifically Neoli uh, marine sanctuaries, the no-take, enforced, old, large, isolated. And when you have all those five characteristics working together, you have a multiplier effect in biomass and biodiversity. So um, we have a, a whole variety of technology tools that we're using um, and including um, the Brev's uh, camera systems. Um, we have uh, various habitat mapping techniques with enhanced uh, reef check using the drones also. And so people have a better baseline of um, you know, their, their ecosystem health and then how it's improving over time. So I, I hope that provides a bit of an overview of uh, what we're doing out here. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you to Dirk and, and uh, move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Again, New Day Investment, Doug, for letting me participate in this. Thanks, Sam and Scott. We all learned a lot about the threats and opportunities in coral reefs. And now we have 
an economist, a fisheries economist, who's going to talk about the ROI on these teal new deals. So Monsi, take it away. Thank you, Doug. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about the ocean and economics, my favorite topic. Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, various return on investments uh, that come from um, interventions that protect various um, marine and coastal ecosystems and a, give a bit of flavor. Uh, um, the next slide. Uh, so we, um, when we talk about, uh, so in this presentation, I'll be covering uh, uh, the benefit cost ratio for reforming fisheries um, that will help build the fish population. Uh, or I would give a bit of uh, analysis around mangrove protection and then designation of marine protected areas. Um, when we economists do such analysis, uh, we assess different types of benefits and they're wide ranging. So we look at economic benefits by this, I mean, profits and revenues that come to households and businesses, health benefits, uh, which include enhanced nutrition, uh, reduction of risk of premature deaths from uh, reduced greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, social benefits, uh, such as poverty reduction, uh, food security, and environmental benefits uh, in terms of mitigating the risk of climate change, as well as uh, protecting communities from storms and floods. The types of costs that we look at uh, include cost to business, cost to households, cost to government. Sometimes we look at trade-offs from uh, these interventions if there are unintended impacts. Um, uh, for example, if you were to build a wind farm, are there any impacts on biodiversity, positive or negative, that needs to be accounted in the analysis. Um, one important point to make is when we derive these estimates, inevitably they're partial estimates uh, because it's not always possible to quantify all the impacts. And this includes costs and benefits, but particularly for benefits, given the wide ranging benefits, sometimes it's not possible to put a number and monetize all of them. So it's quite likely when we provide these figures, they are underestimates and in the return on investment is going to be significantly higher. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So these are um, some examples of uh, benefit cost ratios um, uh, that have been uh, derived for uh, different interventions. Um, and uh, so as you can see, uh, rebuilding fisheries, uh, which will involve uh, reducing overfishing by stopping illegal fishing, um, uh, banning discards and other measure, measures would lead to benefit that are nine times higher than costs. Um, for expanding marine protected areas, the benefits can be up to 20 times higher than costs. Um, for mangroves, these are the average, and this is not a high estimate, but the average is about five times higher than costs. These are big numbers, and they are substantially larger if you uh, compare them to construction projects or infrastructure projects. Um, in the world. Um, it will be very difficult for this presentation to break down which uh, the components that go into these valuation studies and what has been monetized or not. But uh, I'd definitely like to give a flavor. So when we talk about uh, rebuilding fish stocks uh, and we, we assess the benefits, a chunk of these benefits uh, include the income, the revenues and profits that go to fishermen from improvements in productivity of fish yield and uh, fish production. So when you take measures to reduce fishing effort, uh, in the short term, there will be uh, low income, but in the long term, the benefits will outweigh the costs. And that's what the uh, studies show. And, these, uh, and this can happen within 10 years once the stocks improve. Um, expanding marine protected areas uh, will dip the benefits assessed often uh, depends on uh, the ecosystem that that uh, that we are protecting. Um, but one of the key statistics is that 
if you look at the ecotourism that comes from protected areas, it's about um, six, four to 12 times higher than non-protected areas. So the gains are significant in terms of ecotourism. Um, then the third one is mangrove protection. When we look at mangroves, um, essentially, uh, they so for those who are not aware of mangroves, they are uh, small trees and uh, that uh, that grow on the coastline in saline and brackish waters, and they are a huge powerhouse uh, in terms of storing carbon. Uh, the soil sequestration uh, is 10 times higher than terrestrial systems. So this means that they capture carbon uh, from the atmosphere and store them. And this is very important in terms of uh, measures to mitigation, mitigate climate change. They provide livelihoods to a number of fishermen um, and fisherwomen and um, in terms of fisheries productivity, uh, in terms of uh, medicines that come from these ecosystems. Uh, so they're very important for the communities that depend on these ecosystems. Um, finally, one of the benefits that we assess is the protection that these mangroves provide to coastal communities. Um, for example, ma by uh, mangroves itself can reduce the height of waves from uh, a 100 meter mangrove area can reduce the height of waves by 33%. Uh, uh, and a 500 meter mangrove could again reduce the height of waves to 50 to 100%. And these are, the impacts would mean that you're saving lives, you're saving livelihoods, um, and you're saving eco ecosystems. Um, and this brings me to an example that's very close to my heart. Um, I come from Calcutta, uh, the eastern part of India, and uh, that region, including Bangladesh, has experienced um, uh, the devastation brought about by Cyclone Amphan. Uh, this level of cyclone has not been seen in 70 years. Um, it has cost lives, livelihoods of very poor communities, and also destructions in the ecosystem but the loss would have been so much more significant if we did not have those mangroves. Uh, it's uh, Sundarbans. So Sundarbans is one of the largest mangroves in that area, and it has consistently protected the regions from cyclones. So in this very short presentation, I'm hoping, I hope I gave some um, idea about why ocean is not, we shouldn't look at oceans as, just a victim of climate change. Uh, there, these, with the right interventions, with uh, engagement with policy, science, businesses, technology, oceans can be actually a new ally in our fight against climate change. And there's new analysis that is being done by WRI that looks at how blue recovery will be essential for uh, economic recovery post uh, COVID. And I'm happy to provide more information on that. Will be me. Thank you, Monsi. Uh, and I, I, since I started out, out in the stratosphere with the uh, 100 mile look at the planet, I'm now gonna go uh, into one of the solutions that Monsi just suggested, which are marine protected areas. So, um, and then Neil is gonna take us home from there immediately following, uh, talking about aquaculture. So if we can start the uh, slide deck, please. So California enacted an incredibly bold conservation initiative in uh, the early 2000s, and it resulted in a network of uh, 124 marine reserves as a necklace up and down the state. This is the second largest network of marine reserves in the world outside of the Great Barrier Reef. It's also the only temperate network designed to have the networks flow from one to another. And so we're gonna go and visit the eldest of those networks right now. Next slide, please. So, um, the way the ocean is laid out, most of the biomass is, is in the continental shelves of nations, including in the US. And so 
This is where Mare does our work, Marine Applied Research. We're a nonprofit that deploys robotic submarines to go down and get the deep water data that below scuba depth. So uh, next slide, please. Here we go now to the Santa Barbara Channel Islands in Southern California. And this is the network of the marine reserves in purple. And hopefully you can see it on your screen, but we've circled the red reserve and the blue fish sites. And we're gonna compare those over time by visiting them year after year with a robotic submarine and quantifying the fish that are being targeted by recreational and commercial fishers as well as the invertebrates and the structure forming animals, the sponges and corals that live there. And yes, there are deep sea corals in California. Next slide, please. So the way we gather the data is that we fly our remotely operated vehicle along the seafloor from the ship above. We collect all of this video data as, long, as well as water quality data, geo-reference it or na uh, navigationally locate it. And then we quantify it initially with a marine biologist, and then now as we're moving into artificial intelligence and marine or machine learning, we're processing it that way as well. Next slide, please. So here's an example of results. The baseline, which we concluded in 2009, this is one of our sites called Gull Island off Santa Cruz Island. So the upper two graphs um, are showing the number of fish that we encountered in that one black box. And you can see very quickly, the lower right-hand box has a lot more fish in it. And that's what we call a rebound. And it turns out it wasn't just inside the reserve, this happened also outside. So next slide, please. This is what it looked like. So sometimes we may have a symbol of a single fish, but in reality, they are stacked like firewood. They are all on top of each other. And if I remember correctly, there's 23 of these species, again, sought after by commercial and recreational fishers. Next slide, please. So I hate to scare people with some bar graphs, but we're just gonna go there for a moment. So the baseline period, we saw about 15 of these sought after fish per kilometer of seafloor survey on average, very stable. In when we returned in 2014 and 2015, that jumped 270%, and not just inside the reserves, but also outside. And that's the return on investment. Now, we, unfortunately, the state of California just froze a large part of our funding to continue the Southern California work, which we are heading to see in 12 days. The reason it's an unfortunate timing is next year, which is also the UN Decade of the Ocean launch, these marine reserves are gonna get evaluated for their efficiency up and down the entire state. This is a golden opportunity, again, with the world's second largest network of marine reserve to show the economic return on this investment. So if you have any interest in this, please invest with us to get the full data set to the resource managers that are working with us to showcase how marine reserves replenish fishing populations. I think that's the last slide. Oh, yeah, this is the rationale. So thank you very much. And now we're gonna move directly on to our next speaker because we're a little short on time. Thank you very much, Dirk. I appreciate the optimism from Dirk and Muncie, but I must confess to being a, a pessimist. Do I need to start the video here? Or have you started it, Nigel? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the optim optimism, but it's a pessimism that I have that's born of experience. I was previously uh, in charge of managing fisheries down in the Cook Islands, tiny little islands down in the South Pacific they're actually a useful microcosm for the planet. Uh, and it was fairly disheartening work just because you kept butting heads up against human nature. Steve Gaines from the Bren School at UCSB cites some work that even if we optimally managed all of the fisheries on the planet, that we might only be able to provide around 5% of the future protein needs. And yet consumers are told to eat more fish. Americans should be eating more fish. You should be doubling your seafood consumption and 
one of the meta studies showed that this could lead to a 19% reduction in overall mortality amongst Americans because of the benefits of uh, the omega-3 fatty acids. At the same time, we've got a planet of nine to 10 billion people that are increasingly affluent. We can't feed those people with beef the way that Americans eat hamburgers. There's simply not enough fresh water. There's not enough land area. And because of the greenhouse gas emissions from terrestrial land animal production, we'd end up with an atmosphere more like Venus and soils that are more like Mars. The UN High Level Panel on the Oceans, Muncie was part of writing this report. And I'd like for you to speak some more on this later, Muncie, but it was a UN High Level Panel heads of government focusing on the oceans. And one of their five recommendations that humanity needs to transition from terrestrial agriculture, terrestrial animal production to marine based food production systems. And the beauty of aquaculture is that it will actually can increase seafood availability as Mike Sutton was recognizing earlier, that we need to be able to increase the seafood availability. And this could be better for consumers. And also if we do it right, it's better for the planet. An important part about how we do this right is to move out into deeper water further offshore where whether you're farming fish or macroalgae or shellfish, essentially it becomes an ecological island. And there's already abundant science that shows that so long as it's sited properly in deep water with good currents and that it's well managed, that there'll be no significant impact. And often there'll be no detectable impact whatsoever. You can't tell the difference in water quality from up current of the net pens and down current of the net pens. Another study out of UCSB recently found that if you sus sustainably, responsibly managed it off your aquaculture and removed all of the available ocean space out to 200 meters deep that's used by other uses, that they could still produce up to 100 times the current wild catch of seafood on the planet. It's not just an environmental responsibility. It's not just an economic opportunity, but it's also a moral responsibility. The US has a $17 billion seafood trade deficit. We have the second largest EEZ on the planet. We're the largest importer of seafood by dollar value, but there has never been a single fish grown commercially in the US EEZ. Essentially what we're doing is exporting our ecological footprint to other countries where we have no control, no input over their environmental standards or over their food safety standards. Certainly the regulatory hurdles for offshore aquaculture in the US are intimidating, but there was a recent executive order from the White House that had identified offshore aquaculture as a priority for the responsible agencies and to start to move this forward. Importantly, it did not remove any of the regulations that are required for oversight of offshore aquaculture. And so there has been a lot of hand wringing from anti aquaculture activists about this executive order, but they're ignoring the science. And I was really pleased to see that the those environmental NGOs that are driven by science, WWF, Conservation International, uh, the Nature Conservancy, Environmental Defense Fund, they to date have had no comment on this executive order, they are willing to wait and see they see the potential for scaling offshore aquaculture, for scaling seafood production in a responsible manner. And I think the challenge now is put on us as industry and as investors and as seafood consumers to be supporting the scale up of offshore aquaculture in a responsible manner here in US waters where we can have best control over those standards. Thank you very much, Dirk, and thank you ESGX for putting this all together. Uh, Dirk, back to you, or Mansi. So, I, I was hoping yeah, we I could can... move on to the next panel, Mansi, just because we've run into their time a little bit. So, uh, that good. Nigel, if yeah, that, that that sounds great. So, look, let me hand over now to to Chris Oakes to introduce the next panel, which I think is also going to answer one or two of the questions that have come up during the chat. So, Chris, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Excellent. 
Thanks, Nigel. Um, thank you for uh, to the ESGX team to be doing this. Um, before I ask my panelists to turn on their mics and and um, videos, I'd I'd like to sort of make a, a connection. So, uh, my name is Christopher Oakes. I'm the vice president of product and market development at a biotechnology company called Novo Nutrients, and we make food and feed from CO2. So we're able to take industrial waste emissions like the CO2 from a cement plant and turn that into a microbial protein that can go into aquaculture feeds. So Neil, Mike, and others during this program have talked about sort of an aquaculture feed conundrum. Uh, my company is focused on solving that problem using biotechnology. I'm trained in marine biology and I've focused on aquaculture my entire life. And I want to talk about something that's a little bit outside of my you know, general domain of expertise and that's deep seabed mining. Um, I'm not a deep seabed miner. One of our panelists, uh, Mark Gordon is, but what's interesting to me and really the goal of this panel is to look at the value of the biodiversity and the microbes and the, um, the, the other flora and fauna that um, that are found in the, well, no flora, the other fauna that's found in the uh, deep sea. And so with that, um, Lewis, Mark, um, Maureen, uh, Shirley, could you start your videos? I'd like to introduce the panel. And so uh, Dr. Maureen Hillenmeyer is the founder and CEO of Hexagon Bio. Dr. Lewis Metzger is the founder of a stealth ocean technology startup. Um, Mark Gordon is the CEO and chairman of the board of Odyssey Marine Exploration. And Dr. Shirley Pomponi is a research professor at Florida Atlantic University. So we've got a nice swath of perspectives of uh, industrialists, academics, and then the users of, um, of biology um, for commercial applications. Now, the goal of this panel is really to raise awareness around mankind's extractive practices and and with you know the global demand for extracted seafood and minerals from the ocean depths you know they're going to be global ramifications right and the deep sea floor is really the largest ecosystem on the earth it's interconnected it covers about 65 percent of the uh, planet's surface and the deep sea provides a range of important ecosystem functions goods and services um, such as biogeochemical cycling, carbon sequestration, and the provision of food, as well as bioprospecting potential. And then, of course, vast energy and mineral reserves. And yet we just don't know very much about it. And in light of World Ocean Day coming up, uh, I'd like everybody to walk away with at least one thing, that in July, the International Seabed Authority will be voting on whether or not to grant exploitation rights for seabed mining. So I encourage everybody who's, who's joined us today to just look up the International Seabed Authority and know, um, know what that agency is doing and know that there are decisions being made that will have global ramifications. Um, but you know, given, given the state of, of the world and, and, glo and global policy, I'd like this panel to really have a practical discussion um, uh, today if the exploration and potential exploitation of the deep seabeds are going to go ahead, um, how do we maximize the attention you know, given to conservation and biodiversity? You know, how, how could an alternative focus of bioprospecting bring a tempered and eco-friendly approach to our further encroachment on the ocean deep? So I thought I'd start with uh, Shirley and, and ask if, if you could share with the audience a little bit about your work um, and talk through some of the challenges associated with just accessing deep sea environments. Um, there's not an underwater Uber that you can just call. It's, uh, it's pretty hard and expensive to get there. Uh, and you're on mute. Okay, thanks for the reminder. <laughs> um, I've been part of a multidisciplinary team at Harbor Branch Oceanographic for the last 35 years. Uh, doing marine natural products drug discovery. So the team consists of marine biologists, microbiologists, natural product chem, uh, uh, cancer cells and so on. And uh, our unique niche was back then and, and, and actually still 
being able to access a deeper water environment. So instead of just doing scuba, we had access to a really nice manned submersible, a couple of them called the Johnson Sealing Subs that enabled us to go into deeper water. So down to about a thousand meters. So not, not what we're talking about in the deep sea or high seas, but still fairly deep. And the nice thing about that is that you have the ability to uh, get access to some novel uh, marine organisms. We work primarily on things like sponges and salt corals, tunicates, things like that, um, and not potentially novel chemistry, so that you're, uh, you know, be able to, to be able to identify some uh, novel chemicals with novel bioactivities as well. The problem with this is that, well, there are a few problems. One is that, of course, we don't have the submersibles anymore; they've been decommissioned. It's expensive to get out to the deep sea. So access to that environment, I mean, historically, our expedi expeditions focused on collections, not getting bycatch from some other, uh, you know, mission that was focused on, you know, fisheries or deep sea mining or anything like that. The whole reason for that was because we wanted to be very um, specific uh, and, uh, you know, focus on uh, not damaging the environment, being able to very carefully select the samples and then not damage those samples as well. Um, but it's, the sustainability issue is an issue, you know, is a problem as well. So not only getting access to those deep sea environments, especially as we move further and further offshore, where it's quite expensive to get out there, but what happens if you find something that's really active? How do you get, get out there to get some, gets more? I mean, so it's been primarily an extractive procedure uh, if you get a marine derived drug lead, how do you get enough material to for clinical evaluation and, and eventual clinical use? Um, often the compounds are found in very trace amounts. And so in response to this, the uh, biodiscovery has been a lot, become a lot more targeted. Um, the, the tests, the bioassays that are used to, to try and discover unique compounds with very specific actions, say as an anti-cancer, or more specifically an anti-pancreatic cancer or something that has even more specificity. Um, so those bioassays have become more targeted. But companies like Hexagon, and you'll hear something about that from Maureen in a few minutes, have, um, have also become, you know, sprung up to look at more targeted approaches to biodiscovery. Um, some of the other you know, uh, challenges that we faced are things like benefit sharing, you know, data, samples, and it, even, it becomes even more uh, difficult to regulate on the high seas. And Lita talked a little bit about that in the opening, in the opening panel. So I'll leave it at that for now. Wonderful, Th thanks Shirley. And I think that really you know, what I want this panel to share with the audience is how do we look at deep sea activity, right? There's, there's an extractive practice of mining where, where there are you know, very expensive operations that are going down to, you know, to go to a hard to get to place. Um, but how do we put other values on the ecosystem and the biology that's down there? And so you know, today there are some 7,000 molecules that have been extracted from the ocean already and their uses are you know, range from medicine to industrial applications like my own, right? Um, special enzymes and special uh, um, genetic pathways allow me to change the way my microbes work to improve the feed for aquaculture, right? So as an industrial biotechnologist, it's important to have access to enzymes and different biochemical pathways to make the products like our aquaculture products um, better and more sustainable. And so uh, I guess, Lewis, you've spent years leading teams making scientific discoveries in the realm of infectious disease at Novartis. You know, why have you turned your attention to ocean biodiversity? So thanks, Chris. Um, it's actually an interesting question. Uh, the chemical matter that humans can make in a fume hood, what we can synthesize as chemists, you know, using techniques that you would do industrially, uh, is somewhat limited, actually. And the chemistry that is catalyzed by the enzymes encoded by the genes in nature uh, often uh, allows chemicals to be made that humans probably wouldn't even dream of, let alone you know, be capable of making easily you know, in the laboratory. And so what I found out, uh, you know, I think very uh, clearly in my work, uh, Novartis, uh, Novartis Infectious Diseases uh, existed until 2018, uh, was uh, that it's actually difficult to find chemicals that, for instance, get into a gram-negative bacterium. Uh, it's difficult to find chemicals that cross a blood-brain barrier. 
And if you look at medicines, uh, there's, there's quite an enrichment of what we call natural products. And these are molecules that have special shapes, special properties that, like I said, are very difficult for humans to make, but are easier for nature to make. And so if you think about where that sort of chemistry evolves, uh, diverse environments, including extreme environments, uh, are places where one would find that. And so I think that there's treasures, genomic treasures, that encode chemistry that humans can't do easily uh, in the deep seas and the coastal seas uh, and really everywhere on Earth. And that evolution happened in deep time and the conditions in which it happened are not easy to recreate. So I think that our humanity's greatest treasures that we have access to are actually the genome of all these genomes of all these species that live in these, these environments. And so I think there's a huge opportunity for discovery in many different fields, not just medicine, uh, but also um, uh, a, a strong argument for preserving biodiversity because we don't know at all what we're losing, uh, but we have, and I could name them later, a number of examples uh, where what we found has been extremely valuable and even uh, life-changing for big wedges of humanity. Thank you, Lewis. And so to talk about seabed mining a little bit, um, you know, nickel, cobalt, manganese, and copper are really four of the major um, target elements that are, that are, um, that agencies are looking to extract. They're, they extract these nodules. Um, but there's a, there's a difference in, in those elements that are being extracted from the deep seafloor because those, those nodules in the deep seafloor are, are made through biological processes. They're, they're biogenic. Um, they're formed around something biological. And so you know, this biogenic formation in and in, in itself offers a, a tremendous sort of um, amount of value to understand that process. Um, and so you know, that's why I think it's, you know, there's a real opportunity to look at the efforts around deep seabed mining um, in a different light, right, in, in, in potentially a collaborative light. So, Mark, you, you know, you're, you, you are a real live treasure hunter. Um, Mark's story is, is really amazing. I'll let him share a little bit more about that. Um, but you're interest, you know, into these hardcore deep sea open ocean operations. Um, and you're already collaborating on some projects related to drug discovery. So um, I, I'd love to get your, your take on it, but I know a, a video is a great way to, to do that. So Nigel, could you um, tee up the, um, the video um, about Odyssey exploration, please? Uh, not getting any audio. Nigel appears muted. Yeah, Nigel, you're muted. We're still not getting audio. We will proceed until it it um, it goes over. So, Mark, perhaps you can uh, describe. <laughs> um, I've I've got it now. If you're ready. Ah, okay. Let's do it. A company famous for finding gold and silver on the ocean floor is teaming up with a local biotech firm to hunt for a different kind of treasure, the kind that may one day cure cancer. We're taking action for your health tonight with what this new adventure might mean for all of us. Deep in the ocean off of South Carolina, Odyssey Marine Exploration is currently conducting an archaeological excavation of a shipwreck site. But this time, they're looking for something more than gold, silver, or glass pieces of history. They're looking for microscopic treasure buried in seafloor sediment. We always say it's great to find the gold and the silver, but with what we could find in that sediment that could possibly provide a cure for cancer, that could be the real treasure. So Odyssey Marine is hauling up sea gunk and transporting it to the Tampa biotech firm Morphogenesis, where researchers are analyzing the deep sea sand isolating microorganisms that live 7,000 feet deep because they have developed ways to be able to live at extremes in temperature, extremes in pressure, and extremes in light. So they have devised new ways to physiologically be able to grow and exist. And we're interested in tapping into that and looking for new potential drugs for anti-cancer in humans. Lawman, who is a co-founder of Morphogenesis, says they have a potential antibiotic already that they've worked with St. Joseph's Children's Hospital on. Another big goal? And we're looking principally at 
um, multiple drug resistant bacteria, the ones that you see in hospital infections uh, and in community homes where they're resistant now to all potentially all known antibiotics. And there is a need now to find new antibiotics that can control those. While exciting, because the ocean is full of millions of untapped microorganisms, Lawman says it will probably be years before any biotech treasures reach your pharmacy store shelf. Taking action for your health, Linda Hurtado, ABC Action News. So Mark, I, I know from our discussions and your participation on the board of, of Mare with Dirk, I'm also a board member, um, that your work is really uh, helping to make you know, these important advances for the scientific community and that there's a commercial interest in, in taking a sustainable approach to archaeology and, and seabed mining. Um, how do you see an operator like Odyssey working in partnership with an NGO like Mare and scientists like Shirley and uh, biotechnologists like Marine and Lewis um, to explore the biodiversity of the deep? Yeah, well, Chris, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Um, feeling a little intimidated being the only non-PhD on my panel, but uh, I'll try to do my best. Uh, I think that the answer is the, the connection between the commercial and scientific community. It was, it was illustrated on that little video clip. Um, one of the main uh, impediments for my colleagues that are scientists uh, is the funding to get out and work in the deep ocean. Um, Odyssey currently works to a depth of about 6,000 meters quite regularly. Um, this working in this environment, you need about a million to $2 million a month to run an operation out there. But the good news is, it's very low incremental cost for a company like Odyssey and other commercial operators uh, to offer to gather samples for the science community. So uh, in that particular example with morphogenesis, uh, on one of the shipwreck sites, we recovered and uh, what turned out to be a, a protein that they were able to isolate and replicate, and it had antibiotic uh, qualities. And in early lab testing, it's showing promise of working against six of the seven known forms of antibiotic resistant staph infections. So that's a uh, specific example. And I think that was what drove me also to join Mari. I think that there is um, a link between nonprofit work to protect the ocean and a responsibility for the commercial operators that are working in the deep ocean uh, to protect the environment that we work in. And uh, we're spending a lot of time and money on science to ensure that the practices we develop actually will lead ultimately to a healthier marine environment. I think it's important for the audience to, to take a step back and, and let's put funding into, into some context. Um, you know, NOAA, right, the United States uh, Oceanographic, Atmospheric and Oceanographic uh, Administration, their budget is what, six to eight billion dollars a year and half of that goes towards satellites and the stuff to look at weather. Um, and it costs ten to twenty thousand dollars a day for ship time to be operating in in the offshore environment. Um, and so, yeah, at least I see Shirley saying, <laughs> um, yeah. "Yeah, more than that." I agree with Shirley. <laughs> and and so, and so, really, you know, a major conundrum is there are not deep pockets, you know, funding the scientific exploration. And so, really, the only folks that are getting resolution to what's going on down there are the commercial operators. So. I, you know, I, I've always focused on the business of biology, and I believe that sustainable businesses um, are going to work hand in hand with the explorers and with the scientists that, that are thinking about um, conservation. So, you know, that's, it's just, a, it's a challenge. And, you know, I think a, a good example, and as contentious as he may be, but um, Craig Venter, right, the, one of the leaders on the Human Genome Project who came up with, you know, arguably a, a team, but one of, the, one of the instrumental folks who came up with shotgun sequencing, um, he set out afterwards and did a global ocean sampling expedition. And this was uh, inspired by, by the voyage of the Beagle, right? You know, the voyage, the, the ages of discovery are seemingly lost these days. Like we've, we've been to every corner of the planet, but we haven't. There's a lot to go discover in the deep sea. And I think about um, you know, leveraging the operations that are likely to happen, right? We have to be realistic and pragmatic. Um, these operations that are likely to happen, um, how do we take advantage of that and, and turn, it, turn it into an age of discovery versus just an age of, of extraction and exploitation. But just getting there and getting the samples is, is hard, but it's not just about sequencing the 
samples like that that doesn't get you much more than a bunch of you know than gets you you know gets you the list of the, uh, the nucleic acids um, that make up DNA. So Maureen, you're at, at Hexagon Biosciences, you're building you know, bioinformatics and a discovery platform at Hexagon Bioscience. You know, as a non-ocean person, um, you know, if you had access to these deep, you know, to, to a deep sea equivalent of what Craig Venter's um, expedition data was, how, how would you approach the, you know, how, sort of screening it and looking at the capacity for producing bioactive compounds, you know, that's encoded in the genome? Right? It's, it's not just getting the, getting the code, it's, there's a whole art to it. So could you, could you tell the audience a little bit about that, that art? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I'm Maureen Lundmeyer. I'm founder and CEO of Hexagon Bio, a biotech company discovering new medicines for cancer and infectious disease using some of these uh, DNA sequencing methods that Chris is talking about. Uh, and also, as Chris said, I'm not specifically an ocean person, uh, but I've gotten to know Chris and some of the panelists here that I share interests with. Um, so I'm going to highlight what I think we can accomplish in medicine by learning from drugs that nature has already evolved for us, including in the ocean. Um, so a little bit of background real quickly, just zooming out, um, half of all FDA approved cancer drugs uh, originated from natural sources and three quarters of all antibiotics. So the most famous example is probably penicillin discovered in a fungus. You may have learned in school the story, Alexander Fleming was growing bacteria on a Petri dish uh, in his laboratory. A fungus flew in from outside, started growing on that plate and started secreting something that killed that bacteria. Um, so Fleming isolated that active component uh, called penicillin, which became the first antibiotic. Uh, so other famous examples of drugs discovered from these sources um, include the anti-cancer drug, Taxol, uh, the cholesterol-lowering drug, statins were found in a fungus, um, and some antiviral drugs were actually found in sea sponges. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. So why did these medicines evolve? It doesn't really make sense at first. Why is nature handing us all these useful drugs? Um, they evolved for themselves, probably as a form of chemical warfare where two species are trying to kill each other off, um, or maybe as signaling molecules where they're trying to signal to each other. So penicillin is an easy example to understand. That's a case where a fungus was trying to kill bacteria. Um, some of these examples are a little less clear at first, like the statins, why would nature give us a cholesterol drug? Um, until you learn that cholesterol is actually essential to fungal cell membranes. So the statins evolved again as a toxin where one fungus was trying to kill off another fungus, a, a neighboring species. Um, so it's very similar to penicillin in that case, uh, just kind of a, a case where one species was trying to kill off another. Um, sponges have been a really rich source of, um, of medicines and clinical candidates over the past decades. People speculate maybe it's to discourage fish from eating them. Uh, a lot of these are just guesses. There have been some really um, powerful nucleoside analogs that have become FDA approved antiviral compounds. Uh, so that's a timely topic today. Um, and, and some anti-cancer compounds as well. Uh, some famous ones that have been found in sponges. And, and Maureen, how do you, so, so uh, thank you for, for covering sort of the, the, the beautiful products that have come from, from nature. Um, but what are what are some of the challenges? And, and Lewis and Shirley, I'm sure you'll you'll chime in as well. But how do you look at sort of these advanced methodologies? Right, people hear about you know next generation sequencing all the time. But what does that mean? Why why does that give us a new opportunity right now to work with somebody like Mark to collect more information? I mean, there's there's so much. We already have a lot of information, right? So collecting more just just you know builds up the backlog. Um, yep. how, how does like hexagon bio science, you know, uh, how, do you, how do you three sort of work with this information and how are we sort of increasing our throughput and capacity for throughput? Because I think that, I think understanding that is gonna help put a value on the biodiversity for the, for the extractive industry players that are looking for the short-term get it 
I got it, sell it, good. <laughs> but you know, this there's a longer play to get to to a significant value from the biodiversity, but it's not what it yeah. used to be. I think it, I think it's better yeah, DNA, now. DNA sequencing is a major enabling technology that has drastically changed the landscape and really was the enabling technology behind this company that um, I launched. So historically, scientists collected samples um, and tested them for activity, like killing bacteria, killing cancer, killing viruses. DNA sequencing came along, and now we can see the genes that encode those medicines, and it can be much faster and cheaper uh, to sequence these species than to collect enough material to test the drug. So it's getting down towards $100 per microbial genome. Um, so if we can just, and you can do that from potentially even a single cell. So minute amounts of material uh, can get you to see all the biodiversity or all the medicines encoded within a species. Um, and at Hexagon, our special sauce or what we use that data for is to prioritize among these millions of medicines out there that, um, or at least chemicals that nature has evolved to the ones that are useful for humans. So we found that um, occasionally these, um, especially microbes, have to protect themselves from these toxins. So they mutate the um, target protein. In the case of the statins and cholesterol, uh, the fungus that makes the statins has mutated its own cholesterol pathway in a pretty obvious way that tells us at Hexagon, oh, this species is making a cholesterol lowering drug. And now we're looking out at all this massive mountain of data that's coming from DNA sequencing just in the last few years and saying, oh, wow, this one is making a cancer drug. Oh, wow, this one is making an antibacterial. Um, so that's how at least our company is using this new data. And it's very exciting. Um, and the number of genome sequences is rising exponentially. Um, so there's a lot to discover here. And as Lewis said, we have to be careful not to lose all of that. This is why I care about um, protection and biodiversity. If, if those go extinct, we lose all those, all those medicines before we can sequence them. Uh, uh, yeah, if I, yeah, actually, if I can jump in here. Perfect. So that, that actually gives us an opportunity to look not only at new collections, but in, in, our, in, you know, in our freezers, in our refrigerators, on our shelves, things that we've already discovered and may have found different act, you know, that had different activities, but now we can go back. I mean, we've got my, you know, repositories. I mean, at, at, at Harbor Branch, we have, I think 25,000 isolates from marine macroorganisms, things like that. So it, it allows us to go back and, and all, like going through exploration through time, going back in and, and, and re-exploring that rep those repositories. And, oh, go ahead, Lewis, please. Uh, mute, check your mute. Sorry, uh, one thing I put in briefly as well um, is what will be driving, I think, the future of the bioeconomy and allows us to look at Shirley's uh, archived samples uh, and maybe try to express them in Marine's expression system to discover drugs, uh, is that um, not only is DNA cheaper than it's ever been to sequence, but DNA is cheap to print. People don't talk about this very much, but the price of printing DNA has gone down. So now one doesn't even need access to the original sample. If you know what genes that are, have been isolated, have been sequenced from it, you can then say, oh, I want to order this gene synthesized, and then you can test it in the laboratory to see what it makes. And I think this is really powerful and this will drive uh, a very interesting uh, future and hopefully uh, um, a strong urge to conserve these evolved data. And, I think and then getting the back, audience, yeah, uh, and getting back to like what Mark was, you know, what the opportunities that Mark gives as well is that now you don't need real special technologies, but we need to just make sure, or even large sample sizes, even some smaller things, and being able to, you know, outfit like, you know, Mark's operations so that these can be collected in a way where you preserve that sample integrity. Absolutely. And, you know, as a board member of Mare, I think it's important to say, you know, or just to share a vision and that's of, you know, the folks who are out there that want to, to support this. Noah's budget, you know, we spent a billion dollars a day, you know, in Iraq. So just from, put that into context when you think about Noah's budget of being six, seven, eight billion dollars a year, right? And so we need the deep pockets to support, you know, the, the non-core mission 
of, of um, deep sea explorers to augment it, to include the, the bioprospecting, the, just the understanding of the biodiversity so that we can put a value on the biodiversity. That's in my mind, pers you know, I oh. think that's, a, that's an effective way to get um, conservative, you know, conservation efforts you know, underway when, when there's a specific value or, hey, there's a cancer drug, I, now I get it. Um, it's so important. And I just wanna share you know, with the audience um, a lot of people have heard of Moore's law, right? With, with microprocessors and, and sort of the, the halving of, of the area needed and doubling of the speed. Um, the, the term used to, to sort of talk about the decreasing costs to read and write DNA, it's the Carlson curve. So that's something to look up and just be familiar with. And it's, it's happening at a pace that's uh, way faster than Moore's law, right? And we saw how uh, dramatic Moore's law changed the world, right? So just just in terms of the biological revolution, um, it's, it, I, I think that's something for everybody to keep an eye on. Um, so, you know, Mark and Shirley, you know, to bring it back to, to seabed mining and oper in operations, um, we talked a little bit about this, but what could you could you touch on some of the bottlenecks? Um, you know, really prevent, preventing just just a massive world, you know, these massive worldwide voyages um, to go and explore these environments. I mean, Mark, you mentioned it's not that much added cost to do some exploration, but you know, if if there were philanthropic organizations backing this, and you know, and and there was a clear partnership that remunerates the country of origin, remunerates, you know, it puts money back into the pocket. Of the of the of the researchers, and it doesn't just get patented and, and put away into some commercial effort. Um, and then the Goya Protocol is supposed to help with that. I mean, there are frameworks; we can always make these better. But you know, what would it take for you know for your operation and and surely to get together and 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 work more closely together, and then send the sequences to Maureen and Lewis to figure out. All right. How do you make the next blockbuster? I mean, I want like let's figure out let's figure that out, and then hopefully somebody chimes in in the comments and says they want to fund that, um, and that would be great. If you want to do it through a not for profit, let's do it through Mare. Yeah, well, I, I think Shirley chimed in a little bit before when you were talking about the budget and her experience on what the costs are, and in pure academic programs, uh, budgets are constrained, and candidly, things are probably unfortunately going to get worse uh, with the impacts of COVID. Um, but the commercial operators, as I mentioned at the outset, I think we have a moral responsibility to work with our scientific community and to give back. So I'm not really even sure it needs that much funding to happen. I think there just has to be better collaboration uh, between NGOs, commercial operators, the academic and the scientific community. And unfortunately, you know, sometimes there's just uh, an approach, especially maybe at the NGO level, where there's a resistance to commercial activity because it's commercial activity. And I guess what I hope we can, uh, the hurdle we can overcome is that there's good commercial um, activity uh, that could go on and it could benefit um, uh, the science community at very low incremental cost. And we've done this a number of times already on almost all of our missions. We've offered the opportunity uh, to uh, academics and scientists to give us experiments they'd like to run. Uh, Shirley pointed out, we do need guidance uh, sometimes we need specialized equipment that has to be provided. We've even done some of these services uh, by providing uh, data back to NOAA uh, on some of the uh, deep sea vents that we've uh, explored in, in the South Pacific. So anyway, I'll give the floor to Shirley to get the academics view on this. Yeah, I, I don't have much to, to add to that. Uh, you know, I think that that being able to multi-purpose especially when there's a, an organization, a company that's out for a commercial, you know, for commercial venture, willing to say, okay, we've got space or we've got, you know, the manpower, the woman power to actually do these collections. We've set aside this, you know, freezer that we can put sample, things like that, so that it's, and work more closely, you know, together. I think, so I think that, that, Efforts like this, where we can bring together members of the of these diverse communities, can can really uh, start putting together kind of a comprehensive and an organized approach, and look, you know, at different, uh, you know, look at different business sectors, look at different sections, geographic sections as well. Um, we still don't know, you know, there's a lot to learn about our ocean environment and deep ocean environment. 
you know, we, I, I'm a sponge specialist and I, I work on this in a, with a, a group of, of colleagues from uh, the EU and Canada on a EU Horizon uh, funded project sponges. And we were exploring these deep sea sponge grounds. And some of the findings are that, you know, these are really long lived communities and they're extremely important in carbon cycling, nitrogen cycling, silica cycling on a global basis. And so when we start thinking about other extractive enterprises, you know, like mining, like deep sea fisheries, we need to figure out a way that we're, you know, we will be able to work together, preserve that biodiversity and, uh, and be able to use it as well. Excellent. Well, I think we've uh, we 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 got the short end of the stick, or maybe the short end of the sponge on this case. Um, our our time is up. Um, Paul's face has has appeared to to tell us that. Um, but I, I encourage the audience um, to you know to reach out, ask questions. I would love to to go deeper um, on this. And again, there are opportunities to collaborate. Um, and I want to you know I, I hope to see this happen as a commercial guy, you know, with an industrial biotech company behind me, I am excited to find more enzymes to make my bugs that are making food and feed from CO2 better, right? We're, we, you know, we're taking climate change gases and turning it into products. Um, and that may, you know, the next product may come from the deep sea. So with that, um, I'll turn it back to our hosts at ESGX. Um, thanks so much and thank you uh, to the panel. Uh, Paul, yeah. Thanks everybody for such a deep dive into such interesting innovations um, and to explorations. Uh, this is really inspiring. And now the next time I look at a mushroom, I'm going to think about a mushroom war fighting each other and what enzymes might be there uh, to battle each other. Uh, so there's lots to learn from biology, biotech, deep sea oceanography, marine biology, uh, and finding a blend um, among the science. Uh, business and solving our problems, including the sustainable development goals, one of which is uh, life underwater and life in oceans. So Nigel, do you want to wrap up with good news and then we'll talk about uh, upcoming ESGX? Fantastic, Paul. And I thought I'd put a, a bit of ocean on behind me just to lift everybody's mood. For, I guess for me, reflecting on that, there's some fascinating things in there, perhaps things that you hadn't thought of things you didn't know, progress that was being made you weren't aware of. Certainly, I think all those three things have been true for me. Uh, one thing I took away is that accessing data in some ways is getting cheaper, particularly if you can collaborate with others to do that. And a good chance maybe to shout out to Neil Dobson in the audience who has kindly um, put his hand up to help Lewis and Sam with that. So we'd love to see actual action being prompted through this show uh, live as we progress. So that's wonderful. The other thing that really struck me out of all of this, and this is perhaps because of my connections to Australia and the Barrier Reef, which has in some ways been so terribly overlooked as an important issue for that country, the progress that is being made on accelerating the regeneration of corals, I think is incredibly interesting and perhaps something that I should be following up directly. If there's any way I can help take that into Australia through my network there, I will certainly be doing that. The more broadly then, just before I hand uh, maybe over to Doug to say a thank you to our guests and then back to Paul is to, to draw out that there is a recurrent theme again today that we've seen time and again, which is that with the right the right mindset, what is right for the environment can also be what is very appealing to the consumer and can also be commercially attractive to the businesses concerned or the organizations concerned. The challenge, of course, and we've had a, a, a bit of pessimism or realism in here as well today, that there are clearly gaps and the gaps can only really be addressed through individual action in some way, actions that maybe things you do yourself, things that you can do to trigger consumer behavior and awareness, corporate behavior and awareness, even government behavior and awareness. So I think there's things we can all do and I hope plenty of inspiration in what we've seen today. And so with that, I will hand back to uh, maybe Doug to say a quick thank you and then to Paul to give us a rundown on what's coming up next. Great, Nigel and Paul, thank you very much. And I think Nigel, the pessimism is okay, as long as we're using it as motivation to find solutions. So 
it was almost two years ago that Scott Countryman came to our office in San Francisco to make a presentation to a group of clients and younger people regarding the state of our ocean health. And during this session, we spoke to this group about their sense of the world. Some expressed hopelessness, hopelessness anger, frustration, but all of them wanted to understand what could be done today and that it wasn't too late to do something. And every one of our panelists and the organizations where they work are quickly creating solutions today, but they need our help. And this is the work that all of us need to be doing. So driving recognition of these important issues is incredibly important, but it's not enough just to be aware today. Everybody needs to help. We need to be responsible and change our lifestyles and consumer behavior, as you just stated. We need to buy ocean-friendly products. We need to be participating in beach cleanups and to be mindful of the fish that we're eating and purchasing at the grocery store or at a restaurant. Please volunteer your time at organizations, like especially on beach cleanups and things like that, and where you can contribute capital and donate to these organizations. And if you're making investments in this area, understand what the companies you're investing in are doing. We are dedicated to taking urgent action to support the needs of our oceans. And this is one of the reasons that we've run this ESGX event. And at the core of our work is this idea that by unleashing the vigor of responsibly minded citizens for deep and lasting change, by providing them a mechanism for engagement that's more grassroots, we allow them to share their collectivized desires and change the world. So I'd like to leave you with one last thought before turning things over to Paul. And if you remember anything from today's session, please remember this, that nothing's ever been accomplished without strong faith, conviction, and action. And there's an organization that we, or a, an expression that we use at, at our organization that says, success favors the bold. It's our mission to get individuals, institutions informed, involved, and invested in the causes that they care about, and in particular, ocean health. So please join us in this cause. Thank you to all of our panelists and speakers that have joined today and to our very engaged audience. Uh, looking forward to additional upcoming ESGX events that Paul is going to talk about in just a moment. Uh, thank you, Doug, for organizing us all together. And thanks again for our panelists from the Philippines to Australia to uh, the Bahamas and Bermuda, as well as uh, here in the US. Uh, delighted that we could take a deep dive into oceans. Um, what we'll do next week is um, uh, look at solutions for equality. So as Doug introduced earlier in the episode, uh, we are living in times where we need to catch up fast to have uh, equality equity and justice. Um, so we'll have um, uh, leaders and innovators um, uh, who are black and African-American uh, talk about data, evidence, solutions, tools, and platforms that pursue more solutions uh, towards equality. So stay tuned, uh, we'll be announcing it soon. Uh, we're just mobilizing, things are moving very fast as you might imagine. Uh, and there's multiple um, uh, uh, time commitments that people have. Uh, so always come back to ESGX.org if you want to be informed, inspired, uh, and look for ways to take action. Thanks for being so engaging in the chat box and the questions. We'll follow up with anything not yet answered uh, as well. And we welcome your um, suggestions for uh, content, uh, speakers, and ideas that we can spread to solve our problems, to showcase good news, and to address the problems and challenges in our world. Thanks for joining ESGX.org, and we'll see you next time.